This video contains themes of violence. Some viewers may find this disturbing. Viewers discretion is advised. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for clicking on this video. My name is Omadile Salo and if you're here, that means you're invested in true crime content as much as I am. So welcome, welcome, take a seat. I am going to be posting a lot of content like this. So if this is something that you would like, please like, subscribe and turn that notification bell on so you can get notified when I post a new video. Now that all that is out of the way, let's get right into today's case. So I just quickly want to say that this case takes us all the way to Japan. This is my first time doing a Japanese case and I just hope I don't completely butcher the names. I'm going to try my very best. I checked online for the pronunciations, but I saw different pronunciations and it just got really confusing, but I'm going to do my best, I promise. And I'm also apologizing. This is me apologizing beforehand. I feel like with all these cases, I just apologize because I know I'm going to ruin <laughs> something. But yeah, let's do this. Azumi Muto was born on the 13th of June, 1986, and she was the youngest of three kids. She had two older brothers and she lived with her family in Tokyo. Azumi came from a family of dentists. Her parents were dentists, her grandparents were dentists, her oldest brother was also a dentist and other of her relatives here and there. And so her parents just assumed that their children would grow up and also become dentists, right? It was actually Azumi's grandfather that started this dental clinic in the 50s. Azumi's parents also owned many real estate properties and Azumi and her siblings were directors in the real estate company. Azumi did not want to become a dentist. She was actually in school studying to become a computer programmer and also acting and modeling on the side. Her parents did not get her passions and they tried to get her involved in the um, family business but Azumi was not having this so when she turned 18 she left the house and she created a stage name to focus on her modeling and acting career. Her stage name was Takamine Kakeru. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right because I saw Takamine online. I'm going to put the name on screen and so. She was cast in a role for a small budget movie called Cream Lemon. Cream Lemon was actually based on an anime. Soon, Azumi settled with her parents and she returned home and decided to continue her schooling and modeling while living at home. Azumi did not get along with her older brother. His name is Yuki and they would often get into this little argument. Azumi was very, very intelligent. She was social, she was optimistic about life, but Yuki was very different. Yuki was the middle child and he was only a year older than Azumi and he wanted to become a dentist like his older brother, like his parents, like his grandparents too, right? And he said that he wanted to be part of an environmental conservation effort by using his earnings as a dentist to buy a desert and plant grass to create an oasis. Oasis. How is that word pronounced? Oh my God. Yuki did manage to get into dental school, but he kept failing the exams required to actually become a dentist. He took the exams three times and each of those times he failed. Yuki could not achieve quite the same success that his siblings could and he always came across as a loner, as um, quiet, as weird. I don't like using weird because people call me weird and I feel weird just saying this. Okay, so even Azumi told one of her friends about Yuki that he is creepy and I don't know what he's thinking and that makes me feel scared. On the 30th of December 2006, Azumi and Yuki were home alone. Their parents and brother were visiting family in Fukushima for the New Year holiday. At around 3 p.m. that day, Yuki was talking to Azumi. He said that he was angry and frustrated that he could not pass the dental entrance exam that was required for him to become a dentist. This exam that he had already taken um, three times, by the way, and was about to take the fourth time, right? He said that he was also tired of being constantly reminded um, of his failures by her and by other people. He got so angry that he grabbed a wooden spoon and bashed her over the head repeatedly. 
Azumi's face was swollen and hot, but she was still alive, so she fought back. And she lashed out at him and continued to berate him, saying mean things to him. She said that he had no purpose in life and he was just following what their parents wanted. Now, quickly, I want you to keep that, um, this in mind that this is based on um, Yuki's confession. So there's no other person there to come forward and say, um, there was no other person there to come forward and say, look, no, this is how it happened. Yuki got angrier and he wanted to shut Azumi up for good. He had seen on a TV show that human beings die after being strangled for 180 seconds. So as he was strangling her, he was counting to 180. After 180 seconds, Yuki saw that Azumi was still breathing, so he took her to the bathroom, put her in the bathtub, and held her head under water until she drowned. He then cleaned up the bloodstains that had occurred from their fight. He proceeded to dismember the body in the bathroom with a knife and a saw. He then separated the body parts into portions and put them into four garbage bags and then he hid them in different corners of his room. He also sliced off Azumi's breast and genitals and he said that he did that so no one would be able to recognize if the body was male or female. He then stole one of Azumi's underwears and then left the house to go to his study camp. Azumi's parents and her oldest brother returned home from Fukushima on the 3rd of January 2007 and they found the trash bags with the body parts. They immediately suspected that Yuki was involved and they called the police. The next day, I don't know why they had to wait until the next day, but the next day the police arrested Yuki when he returned home from the camp. Once the news of the murder was released, the media started doing what the media do be doing, bruh. They started to say that Yuki was a necrophile and a cannibal who and ate part of his sister. And the fact that there were like all these little things here and there to back this up did not help. One of Azumi's friends told the police that Azumi said she was really wary of Yuki and a few years ago she said that her older brother Yuki just kept on leering at her with lustful thoughts on his mind and that she was really scared. TGU psychology professor Makoto Oda said, The suspect, the brother, seemed to have always had some sort of tunnel vision. All he saw happening in his life was growing up becoming a dentist and taking over the clinic. He and his sister were extremely close in age and there's no way they could not have had some sort of sexual feeling going on between them. There are definitely the elements needed for incest in place there. Normally these feelings are strongly suppressed but it is the female who generally perceives them more than the male. I think the girl must have realized that something was going on. The Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office did come forward to deny these claims, that these claims were false and they were not helping the case in any way. Yuki confessed to killing his sister right away. He said that he needed to shut her up because of all the horrible things that she kept on saying to him. He was charged with the murder of his sister and the desecration of her corpse. The defense team tried to prove that Yuki was not mentally capable of taking responsibility for the crime. The mental health professional who examined Yuki said that Yuki's mental state was unstable as at the time he killed his sister. At the time of the murder, he had diminished capacity of such an extent it would have been extremely difficult to judge for right or wrong. While the mutilation of the body occurred while he was criminally insane and not capable of being held legally responsible for his actions. The prosecutors on this case were not buying the argument that the defense team brought forward that Yuki was in a bad mental place when he took the life of his sister. They argued that there was already bad blood between the two and this definitely um, would have happened because Yuki was always talking about how he hated his sister for the way she talked to him and also for her bad attitude towards their parents. Their parents came forward to say that um, they knew that things, they knew about like the little arguments, right? But they did not know that things were this bad between the two and 
they should have known they should have done something which is so sad because they're probably going to blame themselves for a very long time and i don't know probably have nightmares too and in May of 2008, the Tokyo District Court found him guilty of murder and sentenced him to seven years in prison. He was, however, acquitted for the mutilation and dismembering of her body on the grounds that he had diminished mental responsibility. The Tokyo High Court judge rejected this sentence, saying that a written statement by Yuki submitted to police gave a chronologically organized and detailed account of events leading to the incident and the crime, suggesting that he had a clear memory of events. The Tokyo High Court increased his prison sentence from 7 years to 12 years. This case is so disturbing and I don't know. He should be out of prison by now, yeah? Yes. Uh, the information out there on this case is really small, so I did my best. I did try to like put everything together. I am really sorry if I mispronounced any of the names. I definitely did, so I'm sorry for that. And yeah. And that brings us to the end of today's case. See you all take care of yourselves. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done that already. And I'll see you for the next one.